What we're going to be doing in the next few weeks, we're going to be diving in and kind of like honing in on these encounters that Jesus had with unique people. And what we're going to do is that we're going to learn from these encounters. But, but here's what I believe is going to happen. Even greater than learning from these encounters, I genuinely believe that the heart of this series is not so that you can just learn from an encounter that someone else had. That the heart of this series would be that you would have an encounter with the living God. His name is Jesus. And here's what I felt like. I was like, Lord, most of the people that we speak to on a Sunday have already encountered you. And this is, a, this is my conversation. This is my dialogue with God. I was saying, God, we, many of us have already encountered you. And he said, but get ready because there's going to be a refreshing that I'm going to do in people's lives. Some of us in the next five weeks are going to experience God like we've experienced him for the very first time. I don't know if you've ever ha had that happen to you, but I've known God for a long time. I was raised in a Pentecostal church. They made you know God. You know what I'm saying? Like you knew who God was, but I had different encounters. I remember I had an encounter with Jesus at 10. Oh my goodness. I get, woo. At 10 years old, at 10 years old, I had an encounter. And then I kind of like, you know, wasn't discipled, just kind of went astray a little bit. And then I had an encounter with Jesus at 17 years old. And I said, God, I will give you my life for the rest of my days. And since I was 17 years old, I've been walking in the ways of, like I had these encounters, these moments with Jesus. And I genuinely believe that's going to happen to many of us in the next five weeks. So I want to encourage you. I want to even told you. I want I told you. I need you to be here the next five weeks. Come on, somebody. I know that you have more sunlight now so you could stay longer for service. Come on, somebody. Um, but I really believe so many of us are going to have an encounter. Let me read to you this text that is found. By the way, this is my probably my second favorite Bible verse. Many of you know that my favorite Bible verse is Acts 20:24. 20, when I get diesel and I get a six-pack, I'm getting a whole sleeve of Acts 20:24. 20, and some of you already think that I have the six pack, but I just have the barrel. But the point, the point is that when, when I, you know, anyway. Okay, so this is my second favorite Bible verse. And it's John chapter 10, verse 10. Listen to what it says. It says, a thief has only one thing in mind. A thief has only one thing in mind. How many of you know of a thief? How many of you know? No, don't worry, here's your hand. That's not a good time. It's just like, not just... The thief has one thing in mind, and, and in this scenario, it's talking about the, the, the heart of the thief, the, the mentality of the thief. By the way, a thief is, is led by the thief of thieves, which is the enemy. In this context, it's, it's essentially talking about the influence, and a thief has one thing in mind. I, I want you to know that the enemy is not double-minded. The enemy is not double-minded. The enemy has one thing in mind. And so if the enemy gives you a promotion, it's not to bless you, but it's to destroy you. If the enemy introduces you to a relationship, it's not to... Mm -hmm. the, that, was too, that was too strong? Too strong. Okay, soften it down, Pastor. Okay, here we go. A thief has one thing in mind. He wants to steal. He wants to slaughter. This word slaughter, it's actually trans, uh, transliterated from the original language. Many people think it's the word kill, but it's actually not the word kill. It's a voluntary sacrifice. So that's why in, in the TPT, the Passion Translation, they go back to the original Greek language. And the kind of killing that they're talking about, the thief's purpose is to steal kill and destroy it's not actually just like kill or murder it's like it's like this voluntary sacrifice in other words what the enemy does is really just create an altar for you for you to lay down your life and voluntarily sacrifice yourself to his altar slaughter it's to steal slaughter and ultimately destroy but i have come someone someone shout i have come he says i have come I've come to give you something. I've, I've made the track. I've gone the way. I've, I've made the traveling. I've, I've made the distance. I, I, I have come. Here's why. I've come so that you can have life. So that you can have life. But here's the thing about Jesus, that Jesus is not trying to just give you any ordinary life. I need you to hear me. He's not trying to give you any ordinary life. He wants to give you a life. Watch this. Everything in abundance. Everything in in abundance. Watch this. More than you can expect. 
Uh, how many remember that the Holy Spirit said about this church that this is a year of greatness? Here's what I want to let you know, that God wants to give you abundance in 2023. Come on, somebody. More than what you can expect. Life in its fullness. Here it goes. Until it overflows. Until it overflows. The title to my message is simply this. Until it overflows flows. I want to get, read one more passage of scripture. It's just going to run through 12 verses really quick as fast as possible because I have 40 minutes on the clock and it's 39 minutes now and I already lost an hour in the day and I got to hurry it up. <laughs> Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. This is in Acts chapter 9 against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he had found any who were who belonged to the way whether men or women he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem as he neared Damascus on his journey suddenly a light from heaven and flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him Saul Saul this is Saul who would later be known as Paul he says Saul Saul why do you persecute me and I love this because Saul says, who are you, Lord? See, I think there's, there's, there's something in all of us that though we don't know God, we know who God, like we know, like we know God when God is talking. Someone asked me, like, like, what does God sound like? He sounds like he's in charge. <laughs> who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Then men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. It says, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I love that because it's like, Ananias is like, you're going to send me to who? The guy that's trying to kill us? So powerful. Even uh, Amanda shared something today about being grounded. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what happened with Paul. Like Ananias had to go serve somebody who was actively trying to kill his people. That's another message for another day. Part three. Yes, Lord, he answered. Verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on a straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And here's the last verse that we're going to touch on. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. My title is simply this, until you overflow. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes quickly? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for these moments that we get to gather together hear your word, Lord God. I pray that you speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus, today. Lord, I genuinely believe that I can't change anybody, but your Holy Spirit can transform anybody. I just pray that you do that in our hearts today, Lord God. Thank you for allowing me to pastor such an amazing church in Staten Island, New York. Pastor some amazing people online. Be a father to some amazing kids and married to the hottest woman on the planet, Lisa Remedios. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people say amen and amen. Give God a praise in this house. Okay. Um, uh, how many of you guys have like the mo a movie that you can watch all the time? Anybody have that? Like, this is like a movie that comes on back when we used to watch live TV. There was like, it came on, you watched it. Come on, somebody. You know exactly what I mean, right? Like, for me, don't judge me. Like, Titanic comes on. Sabes que? Pause, everybody. We just watching this whole thing, all right? Like, I love me some Titanic. And by the way, there was room on that little piece of wood for my boy Jack. I'm just letting you know. Matter of fact, Lisa would have said, come on, baby. Let me be the big spoon and you could fit here in this log. Oh, but I love that. I love that. Titanic. Um, 
I could watch that over and over again. Like it's been out for so many years. I could watch it over and over again. Another one, you might, you might not know this, but I love Back to the Future, all of them. Like I can watch Back to the Future all the time. And another one that I could watch, Shawshank Redemption. Anybody know like Shawshank Redemption? Love Shawshank Redemption. Uh, another one is a romantic comedy. Don't judge me. But have you, anybody seen the movie Hitch? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Will Smith and, uh, and Kevin James. I mean, like this, I love this movie. This, thing, this joint comes on. I'm watching it. Like I'm watching. I could, I never, it never gets old. And essentially, I mean, how many? Right? <laughs> okay, you got to keep it right here. Come on, somebody. I love this movie. Hitch. It's, it's, it's amazing, but essentially the plot of the movie is that there's this guy named Hitch, played by Will Smith, and he's a consultant. And, um, and, and, and Will Smith is essentially a guy, let me explain it this way, like if, if you had a hard time getting someone, like, let's say you were interested in someone and, and you wanted to holler at them, but you kind of felt like they were a little bit of a reach for you, like they, they wouldn't give you the time of day, you know, like... This is how I felt trying to holler at Lisa. You know, I was just like, she's just so beautiful. No, I'm just joking. It was a God thing. But anyway, um, he would, you, he would, uh, you would, he would, you would reach out to Hitch. You would reach out to Hitch, and Hitch, what he would do is he would kind of create this like scenario. He would like curate, curate this perfect circumstance amongst other things. Just put them all together so that you can meet this person that you have an obsession over, this person that you have an interest of. He would make all that happen for you. I'll give you an example. There was a person that was interested in a, in a girl, and the girl loved dogs. She had a dog, and what they did is that they created a scenario in which the dog was in danger, and the man comes and he rescues the dog, and he brings the dog back, and he's like, here, and all of a sudden, you went from strangers to romantic relationship. That's Hitch. Now, the main, the main um, plot there is a man by the name of uh, Albert, and he's in love with, anybody know? No, Allegra Cole. This is, this is, this is Kevin James, so he's Albert, and, he, and he's in love with Allegra Cole. Now, Allegra Cole doesn't know he is alive. Like, Allegra Cole don't even know that he exists. Like, she's around him because he is an advisor to her. But she doesn't even know his name. He, she just sees him as one of the guys who are in the room. And, and what Kevin James does, Albert says, I need Hitch. Let me go get Hitch. And, and Hitch um, sets it all up so that he can have an encounter with Allegra Cole. Now, I love this because it's amazing that Allegra Cole does not know this man. Allegra Cole is around this man but doesn't know this man. I don't know if you see where I'm going with this. And, and what happens is that though Allegra Cole was not looking to pursue or encounter Kevin James Albert, all the while Albert is actually looking to pursue and have an encounter with Allegra Cole. See, what I love about the scenario with Saul is that Saul was not interested in encountering Jesus, but while Saul was making moves, while Saul was around religion, while Saul was about his business, there was someone who had a special interest in Saul and was moving pieces together and creating scenarios like Hitch so that he can have an encounter with Saul. Saul was never interested in Jesus, but Jesus was fully committed, fully devoted, fully in to encounter Saul. And I say that that's who our God is, that maybe you think you're here by accident, but can I just tell you a little, a little secret? Maybe you just think you came to church, but I want to submit to you today that maybe it was actually God who was creating things behind the scenes because he wanted to encounter you. Maybe you thought that that just happened by circumstance and maybe this situation this week happened by, by, by accident or maybe it was just a coincidence. But what if I submitted to you today that it wasn't a coincidence, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't happenstance, it was actually God creating scenarios, putting them together so that he can have an encounter with you. Maybe you came to church on a Sunday and you said, I'm going to sign up for growth track, I'm going to sign up for community community group because they said it was good they said I had to do it they said it would be but what if it was just God trying to set you up to have an encounter with you 
It's the God that we serve, you know. It's the God that, can you imagine that God, that, that you have Jesus who was so committed to encounter Saul. Like many, many of you be like, that's, that's just, it is what it is. No, 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 you don't understand. Like, listen to this. I read this and I was like, wow, this is absolutely crazy. Here you have Jesus, born of a virgin, lives a sinless life, performs many, many miracles, is baptized. He raises people from the dead. He heals people from being blind, from leprosy. He walks on water. He makes five loaves and two fish turn into a multitude that, uh, uh, to feed people. This is Jesus who then dies on a cross is whipped with lashes, then after he dies, he's put in a tomb, he resurrects, he then is shown to about 500 people, ascends to heaven at the right hand of the Father, and says, I got to come back for this guy. Shows up to encounter Saul. But that is Jesus, isn't he? He is the guy that goes where he's needed. He's, a, he's the guy that goes to places where if he doesn't go to that place, you'll never make it to where he is. That's who Jesus is. He said, I must go to Samaria because there's a woman that is by a well that I need to encounter. Oh, Zacchaeus, I must go to your house because I need to encounter you. Oh, you need to understand, I need to go to Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda, because there's a lame man that can't walk to me, but I can walk to him so that he can have an encounter with me. And what if he's doing that even right now at this moment today? He wants to encounter you in this house. It's until it overflows. Jesus makes a claim. And he says this in John chapter 10. I want to read it to you again. He says, the thief has one thing in mind. He wants to steal from you. He wants to slaughter. He wants to destroy. He goes, but I have come so that you can have life, everything in abundance. He says, I I've made the way. I've I've made the trip. I've walked the distance. He says, I've done all this because I want to encounter you, but I want you to encounter me so that you can have life. And he says, not an ordinary life. I'm so tired of seeing God's children live at the bottom barrel of what God has made available for them. What if I told you this, like this is what the Holy Spirit said. I, I promise you, look, if... If it's not overflowing, then what's robbing you? If it's not overflowing, listen to me carefully. If it's not overflowing, because what did Jesus come to do? He came to give you life and a life that overflows. Above and beyond. Exceeds your expectations. That's what Jesus came to offer. Watch this. But Jesus doesn't counter the enemy. The enemy is always looking to counter Jesus. So what the enemy does is essentially what Jesus is saying in this context, he's saying, hey, there's a thief that's always trying to undo what I'm pouring into you. That's why many times you walk out of here filled with the Holy Spirit and someone will do something to try to rob you what you just got deposited. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody. You know exactly what I mean, right? Like this is... Jesus, he says, I've come to give you life and abundance. And I want to give you, I want to give you the, the, um, the original language here. It's this word perazon. Everybody say, shout perazon. This word perazon means super abundant, superfluous, overflowing, over and above a certain quantity. Over and above. Over and above, above. In other words, what God wants to offer you, what, what God wants to give you is much more than what you even need. What God wants to provide for you is something much more satisfying than what you can expect. This is what God wants to offer. He doesn't want to be a taker. He wants to give you a blessing. But he doesn't want to give you ordinary blessing. What he wants to do is giving you, give you overflowing blessing, overflowing grace, overflowing wisdom, overflowing forgiveness. God wants to give you life, but a life that overflows. Someone shout overflow. He says, 
says, I have come to give you, watch this, I have, to, I have come to give you, and this is the picture, and, and, and let me tell you, I've seen so many illustrations with water and cups and all that, and I think it's cheesy and corny, but I just felt like I needed to show you something. But this is the picture I had, like, this is the picture, this is what God wants for our lives, like so many of us are living a life like if God is doing this with us. Oh, I have just enough. Okay, this 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 will this will hold me down for the week, but I gotta come and I gotta come back and get my fix. Okay, oh, and 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 now now what happens is is that when you're here, you look see when you're at this point, you're not overflowing, but what you are doing is comparing. When you're here. You're still in lack. And what the Holy Spirit, this is the picture of Parazon. The pic, listen to me. The picture of Parazon is this. Until it overflows. Until it overflows. God is saying, I'm giving you a life of abundance. Look at that. Of abundance. Come on, somebody. Of abundance. Of abundance. Until it overflows. This is the picture. This is the picture that God gives us. He gives us a life that overflows. But so often, what's happening in life, listen to me. Can I just show it to you? Is that we're like, God, fill me. God, pour into me. We come on a Sunday. And he's trying to pour into you. And he's trying. He's trying to pour into you. But what's happening? You're leaking. And we come week after week and God is saying until it overflows, until it overflows, until it overflows. But God, what happens when I still feel empty even though you're pouring in? Why? Because there's something that's stealing from you. There's something that's stealing from you. And you kind of can't figure it out, but you know something's wrong intuitively. You know something's wrong. It's like, why is it that I feel like this? But then during the week, I can't, I don't feel like I could sustain it. I don't feel like it's, it's happening. I feel like I got to keep trying. I got to feel like, I, I feel like, I feel, I feel powerful in this place. But then I just feel like, like, man, why is it that it doesn't feel the same? And here's what I believe God wants. God wants to rescue you from what's robbing you. Can you write that down in your notes? And if you're not taking notes, take notes. <laughs> God wants to rescue you from what's robbing you. And God's trying to pour his spirit on you. God's trying to pour into your life. But we come to church, but then we leave and we have marriages that are leaking. I'm going to my job and I'm leaking. And it, it, it feels like I can't sustain everything that God is pouring into my life. How many ever felt that way? That you felt like, man, I feel like God is pouring into me. I feel like there's mentors in my life. But I also feel like I can, and this is what happens in relationships. Two people who are leaking try to come together and fill each other's cup. But they're broken themselves. It's like, no, 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 you don't realize, like, I'm leaking. And it's your job to fix it. What would it look like if we looked until it overflows? Until it overflows. Imagine a marriage that looked like this. Come on, somebody. Imagine a marriage that looked. You know what happens when you have a marriage? You know what happens when you live from this place? You're not looking for someone to fill your voids. You're not looking for something to fill your voids. You're not looking for someone to fill your voids. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has filled you in such a way that you're not looking to be a taker. You're looking to be a giver yourself because it's overflowing. It's overflowing in abundance. And so God wants to rescue you from what's robbing you. Like, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's ever been robbed here, but in this context, listen to, listen to the way it's happening. I had a neighbor. I thought they were a friend. And when I was a kid, my whole house got robbed. And, and, and 
this is the word picture that we got to see because in the original language, when Jesus is telling this story, he's saying that there's a thief, but you don't understand. It's not like a thief that's going to come in like a green goblin and say, hey, give me your money. I worked on that all week. How did I do? It was all right. And we think that that's what the thief looks like. Like how many of you know that there's a thief that shows up in your house like that, but that's not the thief that the Bible is talking about. Like the thief that the Bible is talking about actually looks very similar to what you desire. Hear me. So when he says the thief, what he's actually talking about, what he's labeling a thief is someone who poses to be similar to Jesus. In other words, the thief is actually what Jesus is calling a counterfeit himself. Because he says the thief is those that have come before me but they were counterfeits. See, what happens is that the reason when we see that we're leaking, all we're seeing is a thief has some access that is robbing from us. And so what happens is, is that it's not that someone's going to come in and rob you. No, it's, it's like, it's something like this. It's like, it's like, oh, this is just, this is, this is what true love is, but it's actually counterfeit. So in buying into the idea of, the counterfeit love, you're pursuing love, but it's actually robbing from you. It's hurting you. It's damaging you. It's pulling you away from your calling. It's pulling you. By the way, people ask me about relationship advice all the time, and I tell them, hey, how do you know? If, oh, how do you know? This? I simply answer this. Is it bringing you closer to Jesus? Because if it's not bringing you closer to Jesus, they're either not the person for you or it's not the time for it. God bless. <laughs> Is it bringing you closer to Jesus? Sometimes we buy into a false narrative of peace. Oh, I know if I get that job, I'm going to have this and I'm going to be this. And you buy into this desire for peace, and so you take a position that maybe will stress you out even more but because you think financially you'll be at peace, but, then it, but it's robbing from you. It's pulling from you, and, and we're walking around leaking, leaking. And what, what God does, I want, I want to show, show it to you this way. What God does is that he begins to bring people. Right, I want you to write this down. Here's point number two. God wants to renew your vision. So God wants to rescue you from what's robbing you so that you can have more than enough, so that your life can overflow. But the way he does that oftentimes, watch this. Look, look at the way he does it. Whoo, this is so powerful. And I worked on this all week too, so you could, you know. Anyway, here we go. This is the way God does it. See, you're leaking. Hey, but God will bring somebody by your side. See, sometimes what God does is that he'll bring somebody while you're leaking to come who's experienced healing. I think, God, I'm not going to have to clean this mess, but I'll do it together. <laughs> That's what he did with Saul. See, what, what was making Saul leak was religion. I want to ask you what's making you leak today. What's the thing that's robbing you from walking in abundance? And again, this is not for us to become ultra self-aware. I want us to become Jesus aware. But sometimes it is important to take a little bit of inventory, especially if we've been serving the Lord for some time. It's important for us to take some kind of inventory and say, Lord, where, is it the, where are these areas that it just seems like I can't get enough? It just, it just seems like I'm, there's always a void there. And what God does is that God wants to renew your vision so that you can see life differently. Because sometimes the difference between you walking in abundance and not walking abundance is the way you see things. How many know you can hear the same, th two people can hear the same thing and hear it totally different. Right, so what God does, let me give you this point number two. God wants to renew your vision. Acts chapter 9 verse 10. It says, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, and he said, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told me to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask him for a man from Tarsus named Saul. 
So he is, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. I want you to see how many people God used to help Saul out. Because here's the thing. You may not know this, but you have blind spots. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think you have blind spots, that is your blind spot. It's like, I don't know, that's your blind spot right there. And so many, watch, God, this is the way God has wired humanity. This is the way God has interconnected with us, that God places people in your life so that they can help you see the blind spots in your life. And God will bring an Ananias, God will bring some of his disciples to come and help you see things clearly. And at first, you may not be able to do it on your own, so you need someone to uphold you. And sometimes, this is, this is, this is the, frust the frustrating thing about ministry, that sometimes we make enemies of people that will call to elevate us. I don't need your help. I'm good. I don't need you to hold me down. I don't need you to tell me what to do. And I'm just, I just want to submit to you that God has placed some people in your life to help you with the blind spots, to help you stop getting into accidents, to help you stop making the same decisions. And you're over here, now nah, I'm good. I got it. I'm good. I'm going to be all right. No, God is sending you an Ananias. God is sending you some disciples. God is sending you some people. He says, no, they were meant to elevate you. They were, they were meant to come alongside you, and sometimes coming alongside you doesn't always translate as encouragement. It translates as, as correction. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that you are the licensed deputy to go around telling people and correcting people. No, I'm, I'm saying build a relationship with people. Go to people's houses. Talk to them. Break some bread. It's easy to come on the altar and be like, you are in sin. You are in sin. You are in sin. This is a sin. And this is a sin. And you watch that rated R movie, you sinner. <laughs> it's easy to do that. To me, that feels like coward. Anyway, I, anyway. But 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 you know you know you know what's not easy? Doing life with someone. You know what's not easy? Loving someone even when they are at their ugliest. And it's in those, I, listen, people that pass the road, you don't call out people's sin. You know how many times I've told people? You know how many times I've told people? Stop that. You can't continue to do that. How long are you going to live like that? But you know what? I have enough relational rapport with them that I can say those things in. It's cowardly to be like calling out people's sin from a distance and be like, I'm not looking for you to just be a, uh, 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 the, the deputized corrector. No. It's for, you to, it's for you to build relationship with people. But God will put people in your life to correct you, to straighten out your vision. Because here's the thing. It's not that you don't want to see it. It's that you can't see it sometimes. You know, you are not a friend to me. If I'm talking to you for 40 minutes and I got something in my teeth and you don't tell me about it. I'm just telling you, don't call yourself a friend. If I'm talking to you and I still got some whipped cream from the cupcakes that are serving outside. I mean, you are not my friend. All right? Why? Because I can't see it. And God puts people in your life to be like, hey. <laughs> hey, you know, that, you know that thing? And there's some leaders that God has put in our lives. I want to talk to even to the dream team right now. Dream team, there's some leaders that God has placed in your life. Listen to me, not to govern over you. Not to tell you what to do. Not to demand something from you. Not to just want to criticize you, but to, to really straighten out your vision. 
to say, hey, man, you got a little something in your face and you need to clean it up. Let me help you. Because that's what true correction is. It's not just telling you what's wrong. It's teaching you how to do it right. Come on, give God a praise in this place. Okay, that's three. God wants to renew your vision and he uses people. I call it assertive love. We Listen, if you ain't got nobody, come on, somebody. Can I, can I just be frank today? I'm 40 years old. Listen, if you, if you don't have anybody in your life that can put you in your place, God bless you. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk to us for real. Like, there, there's, God, is, God is saying, hey, and, and we're like, God, I need you, God. I, he's like, yeah, you've already encountered me. That's why I'm sending an Ananias to you. And sometimes the most powerful encounters that we will ever have with the Holy Spirit are done through the obedience of a disciple coming to lift you up and correct you. Some of the most powerful Holy Spirit moments that I've had is when my pastor has been like, hey, what's going on there? And, and by the way, when my pastor speaks to me, and I'm not talking about in a legalistic way. I'm not talking about in a, in a manipulative way. But when my shepherd speaks to me, when Pastor Russ talks to me, you could ask my wife. It's as if God is speaking to me. It's like, unless it's a sinful thing, unless it's, hey, Pastor Ruff, Russ is leading me in this direction, I'm going to move in that direction. There's been times in the middle of a leadership meeting and the leaders know it. I'd be like, I'm going to call Pastor Russ real quick because this one is over me. Pastor Russ, what do you think I should do? A, B, C, D. Okay, boom. That pastor's been pastoring for 30 years. And if he can muster up the courage to be like, hey, Ro, you can't do this. The other day I called him about a situation. He said, don't you dare. I can't even, it was juicy. I can't even tell you what it is. <laughs> he said, don't you dare. I said, all right, Pastor. I call him Papa Russ. I was like, all right, Papa Russ. No problem. Why? Because I genuinely believe that God has placed him in my life to help me see things that I can't see. And I believe somebody that's been pastoring for 30 years can see my blind spots. Come on, somebody. He can see my blind spots. And in the same way, God puts people in our lives. We can't be walking around. Can't nobody tell me what to do. Can't nobody. God said, I'm trying to encounter you, man. I'm trying to encounter you. And so I'm bringing an Ananias so that he can help patch up those holes. I'm trying to rescue you from what's robbing you. And I'm just, I'm trying to renew your vision. Because listen, listen, when God renews your vision, you continue to see his beauty. And you continue to see his beauty. And at one point, you're seeing that at one level. But the more you are healed, the more you are saved, the more you begin to see him for all of who he is. Let me give you the last point as the worship team comes up, and I want to give this to you. And I just want to be really, really quick here. The last point is that God wants to replace what you're holding on to. God, I need, I need you to know something about the encounters with Jesus, church. The beautiful thing about God is that God will meet you anywhere you are. You know that he's not a God that meets you where you are just to keep you there. Like no loving father would see their child in the pit, go make the track, be there with them and say, I'll see you there, stay there. A loving father would always grab and try to pull their son out of the pit they're in. See, God doesn't want, God loves you. So much that he'll meet you where you are. But God loves you even more that he's not willing to leave you where you are. He wants to rescue you from what's robbing you. He wants to renew your vision. But he also wants to replace what you're holding on to. This is Jesus. He wants to replace what you're holding on to. What we know about Saul is that later in his ministry he changed his name to Paul. Now, how many know that in the Bible there are a lot of these instances where there's a name change, where God will come and, and he'll say, you are no longer Abram, you are now Abraham. You are not Sarah, you are Sarah. 
I, I love that. He told Peter, from now you will be called Peter. I love that. This is not one of those moments. This was actually a decision that Paul had to make. This is powerful. I read this and I was like, whoa. See, the reason that Paul changed his name is because he understood his calling. And he understood that God was calling him to the Gentiles, which is you and I, non-Jews, or for anybody that is a non-Jew. If you are a Jew, then you're not a Gentile. But he understood that his calling was headed this direction. And so the word Saul is his Hebrew name, but the word Paul is his Roman name. And that time is actually the same name, but there's a version of it. Do you understand? It's like the word Charles and Carlos. Same name, different ways of saying it. Some of you guys are like, that's not the same name. <laughs> when I found out, I thought the same thing too. I was like, those are not the same name, bro. Stop that. Same name, different ways of saying it. Watch this. <laughs> Saul begins to go under Paul. Because he understood that Saul was more attached to who he used to be. And God wanted to replace who he used to be. See, he could have held on to his old identity. He could have held on to who he used to be. He could have held on to something, but God wants to replace what you're trying to hold on to. And sometimes it takes for us to make the decision to say, you know what, I'm not going to hold on to this. I'm going to allow God to replace my name and walk in the fullness and the new identity that God has for me. Yeah. Is anybody hearing me today? Yeah. You, you could begin, make me sound spiritual during this time. What are we holding on to? Can we get up on our feet today? Because Saul had made a decision. There was no supernatural moment. You are now Paul. No. He just made the decision, okay, that's who I used to be. And God is calling me over there to the Gentiles. And I'm not going to hold on to who I used to be. What if the Holy Spirit today wants to replace what you're holding on to. I know, I know, I know. I know it's like, I can't, I can't let go of that because I'm, I'm, that's what I know. That's all I know. All I know is Saul. God wants to replace your Saul. All I know is who I used to be. All I know is how to act this way. All I know is how to defend myself this way. All I know is how to love this way. All I know is how to do relationships this way. All I know is how to grind this way. All I, that's all I know. God says, I want to replace it. And guess what? When he replaces it, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a scholar to where you're going. What happens is, is that you begin to take baby steps all over again. And sometimes it's more comfortable for us to be experts in the minors rather than start a new journey to what's more, what is most important. And so you know how to do relationships one way. God brings you into a kingdom where he shows you how to do it differently. I'm teaching that now. To, I've taught that to Reuben. I've taught that to my children now. My daughter's 14. I want to light myself on fire. She told me the other day, you see, my uncle found his true love at 14. And I say, yeah, there's one in a million. So we're up for this century, girl. <laughs> Yours is going to be at 35. <laughs> teaching, teaching them how to, hey, this is how you do relationships. Not the old way. What are you holding on to that God wants to replace today? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?